All right. Jeremiah chapter 13, there's kind of one central theme here on pride, and we're going to dig into this chapter. And um, it's a real interesting story here. It's kind of like a little bit of another transition. You know, we've been going through these uh, somewhat transitions from you see from chapter to chapter. There's a lot of similarity, and then you kind of shift over again uh, to another kind of new, new stream of thought or whatever. Um, and we definitely see that with here. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get thee a linen girdle, and put it upon thy loins, and put it not in water. And, um, you know, lin- linen is going to be something that's cloth, and it's a girdle is like a belt. So it's going to go across your across your loins. You, you put a belt on, and um, he says to put it not in water. He says, so I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord and put it on my loins. And, you know, just, just right off the bat, God says, hey, go get the linen girl, girdle and put it on thy loins. And what does he say? Okay, so I got a linen girdle and I put it on my loins. And that's kind of just the way that we ought to view the Bible anyways, right? I mean, you read something in the Bible, hey, God says do this. Well, okay, so I'm just going to go and do it, right? Like, what, like, why would we question that at all? Anything that the Lord says, we ought to be ready and just not have to even question it. And just say, okay, Lord, I'm going to go ahead and do what it is that you would have me to do. Verse number three, and the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. So... I went and hid it by Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. Again, just continuing to observe. And he doesn't know why the Lord's telling him to do this stuff at this point. Hey, go get a girl. Okay, there we go. I got it. I'm wearing it. now. And notice, he's still wearing it until God tells him to do something else. So, okay, now here's what I want you to do with it. Now I want you to go hide it by the river Euphrates. Oh, that's kind of odd. Why do you want me to go hide it by the river Euphrates? Okay, well, that's what you said to do, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. And we see plenty of people in the scripture doing things like that. We see Abraham, right, is told to, to get up out of, his, out of his place, out of his land, away from his family, and go into a place that he's like, that I shall tell thee of, right? And he's commanded just to go. And, and all throughout scripture, we see people who are given the word of the Lord, and are expected to just take the word of God by faith. It's good. And that's how we ought to do it. I mean, everything we see here, you know, you may not always understand. You don't always necessarily even have to get an explanation. But when you see it, you need to just accept it and say, okay, God, if that's what you'd have me to do, then that's what I'm going to do. Verse 6, And it came to pass after many days that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, which I commanded thee to hide there. Then I went to Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred. It was profitable for nothing. So when he digs it back up, you know, at first everything was fine. It was great. It was a good belt. He he went and hid it, like he said. And then he digs it back up and he says it was marred. It was was ruined, basically. It was kind of destroyed. And basically he said it's just profitable for nothing. Like there's no use for this thing anymore. And, of course, God wanted him to do all of these things because he's going to use this now as a lesson, as a a picture, as a symbol of something else that's going to happen. He wants to reveal another truth. So he's telling him, hey, do all these things because now I'm going to explain. And, and, you know, oftentimes it's really helpful to have this imagery and to kind of see things and be like, oh, okay, what's going to happen is like this. Right, and this is what he's doing here, and to get his point across, when when you see, you know how mar- like it, um, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but whatever it looked like, it was good for nothing. Right, so you can kind of picture that in your mind. Just just some belt, some cloth belt that's just it's so destroyed, it's so brittle, it's so you know like you just you can't even use it for anything. You can't even use it for, for extra yarn or whatever for uh, another project. It's just it's just profitable for nothing. Then the, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying in verse uh, 8, verse 9, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So that girdle is representative of their pride being marred, being destroyed, and being brought down and brought low and just totally abased and just making them ultimately good for nothing. Because of their pride. And we know that the book of Jeremiah has all this prophesying of 
the coming destruction, the impending doom of Judah and Jerusalem. Right? This is what's going to happen. They're about to be taken captive, you know, however many years ahead that all these things are being taught and preached by Jeremiah. It's it's coming, and he's saying and, and what's he attributing a lot of this destruction to? Their pride. Pride destroys. And so we'll get into that a little bit more in just a minute. I want to keep going a little bit further. He says in verse 10, this evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. And this is one of the things that you got to look out for with pride. He says, this evil people, first of all, they refuse to hear my words. Right? They're just, they don't want to hear the word of God. They're, they're blocking off what God is trying to get through to them. He's trying to, you know, he's using Jeremiah, he's using other prophets and saying, look, you know, repent. Hey, get right. Hey, this is wrong. And they don't want to hear it at all. It says, not only do they refuse to hear my words, then they walk in the imagination of their heart. So just, it's just kind of whatever they think. Not whatever God says, not whatever the Bible says. It's just the imagination, whatever their heart comes up with. And this is why they turn to idolatry too, because idolatry is just imagining up and coming up with some other God. Just like, well, you know, that's not God. This is God. And it's just whatever I think God to be and whatever my views are and whatever my heart says to me. And I'm just going to make this image. And this is a new God, right? And people come up with these gods and choose to worship them and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them. And he says that this people that that is doing all these things, they're not hearing the Lord, they're walking in the imagination of their own heart, they're walking after other gods, they're going to be just like that belt, just like that girdle, which is good for nothing. It's good for nothing. He's going to bring them down so low. He's going to bring that destruction on them, just like this belt rotted and and whatever. Um, that's the condition that they're going to be left in. Verse 11, for as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, right? You, you tighten that belt up around you, around your loins. The Bible says, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. So, He's saying, look, I chose this people. They were, I was pulling them unto me. I'm bringing them up real close and, and, and you know, wrapping them around me. And this is my people. And, and I wanted them to be my people. I wanted them to, to, you know, for a name, for a praise, for a glory. Like, this is what I wanted with this people. This is what I chose them for. But they would not hear it. And again, so he's continuing with this whole girdle analogy, right? Like he's just, he's continuing to go forward with it because what happened to the girdle and it gets destroyed. So he's saying like, this is, this was great. When, when Jeremiah was wearing it, he first tells him, Hey, go get this, go get this girl. Don't put it in water. Just, just get this girdle and wear it. And Hey, everything's fine. He's wearing it and it's doing a great job. And the, the, the children of Israel and Judah were doing a great job at first, right? Like they get established, they get set up. Yeah, they're having, they kind of go back and forth, having problems, not having problems. But ultimately, they're getting to this point to where, you know, they just get away from God. Like when the girdle is just hid in the rock, right? They just completely have distanced themselves, gone away from God, hid themselves in darkness. And now when they're brought out, finally, they're good for nothing. And God's saying, hey, this is what I wanted to do. This is what you were to me, but you didn't want to hear. You didn't want to have anything to do with me. So, verse 12, therefore thou shalt speak unto them this word. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Every bottle shall be filled with wine. And this is just, this is just really typifies really proud people. Say unto them, every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they shall say unto thee, do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Like, of course. Don't we know that already? Of course we're going to have our bottles full of wine. Like, what do you mean our bottles will be full of wine? Like, we know this. Of course we're going to be blessed. Of course everything's great. And look, just so you understand, too, when the Bible's talking about wine, it's like, we have a tendency in our mind to always just assume it's alcohol. And look, sometimes when it says the word wine, it is talking about an alcoholic beverage, and sometimes it's not. But here's the thing. Wine, just in general, is something that, that whether it's alcoholic or not, was, was, would still be considered valuable. 
right? It would be it would be a sign of luxury because you know, taking all kinds of good fruit and food and then squeezing that down and only getting the juice out of that is, you know, it, it costs a lot in terms of all the, the, the sustenance you're, you're getting rid of, right, to, to just get that juice. And, hey, juice is great. We love it. We love it, right? Like, like it, but it, it is one of those things that would be more of a luxury item. So I just bring this up because he's saying, he, he starts off by saying, hey, every bottle shall be filled with wine. And then right away, they're just saying, well, of course, of course it would. Won't we know that? It's just, it's just that assumption that like we're going to have all this great wealth and everything else. Of course it's going to come. And look, we, we should never be that proud to think any day to day, no matter how much we've already been blessed, which was clearly the place here with Judah, that they, they were blessed. There must, things must have been going really well. They were fine for them, and they just expected things to continue going fine. That we can't just assume that things are always going to go good from day to day. And never count what you have as just, well, of course it's going to be there. Of course I'm going to have this or that or this car or this phone or this whatever. Like, like, no, thank God for whatever you have. And, you know, whatever you don't have, thank God for that too. They, you know, just thank God for whatever he has you. Be content with what you have. And don't allow yourself to be so, you know... To have so much where you get to this point and you're lifted up in yourself that you just expect it all, all the time. And just treat it like, do we not certainly know that we that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Verse 13, Then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. So, yeah, you're going to get wine. And then he says, I'm going to fill them with drunkenness. You know, over much, too much of this stuff. He's like, I'm just going to, I'm going to give them all of this stuff. And, you know, it's a shame for the, especially the priests and the prophets and the rulers and stuff to, to be filled with drunkenness. And then look at verse number 14. And I will dash them one against another. Even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord. I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. So what's he going to do? He's going to, yeah, he's going to give them the wine. And he's going to allow them and make them get drunk on that wine. And then he's going to destroy them. And that's the result of their pride, which is why the next verse says in verse 15, Hear ye and give ear. Be not proud. For the Lord hath spoken. It's a warning. Be not proud. You know, the Bible gives us a lot of wisdom, especially in the book of Proverbs about pride and proud people. Uh, if you want to, you keep your place here in Jeremiah 13. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 11. And, of course, there's plenty of places in the Bible that talk about this subject. I'm only going to cover some of those just directly from the book of Proverbs You know, there's a lot of sins we need to look out for in our life. Obviously, you know, you make the argument, all sin. We should, of course, be careful about all sin, and we should, you know, treat it like we don't want to get any sin. But there's definitely sins that are highlighted in Scripture that I think, one, can be, can be very common, and two, can be extremely destructive, right? Like, there's some sins that get highlighted as just being... Man, you know, if I'm going to kind of put an order of, hey, I'm going to really make sure I look out for these sins in my life. You know, there's, there's serious sins that you have to really be on guard against. I would say more so than others. All sin you need to be aware of. All sin is sin. You know, absolutely. But when you look at the devastation and destruction, how much the Bible refers to certain sins, it's like, hey, there's a propensity for this stuff, and there's also a very severe judgment uh, uh, associated with some of these things, right? So, like, for example, you know, fornication. The Bible says to flee fornication and how bad that is and all the people that died as a result of fornication. You know, adultery, even worse. 
these are sins you want to just really make sure that it's just like don't become part of your life. They don't creep in. Like there's no way that you're going to allow that a foothold because they're so destructive and so damaging to your life. But pride is definitely one of those. We see pride is, you know, Satan is lifted up with pride. So that, was, that was his big sin is just, just say, you know, of, of, you know, everything evil in this world. And you think of who, who embodies evil is Satan. Right? Who embodies wickedness and, and, and everything that is anti-Christ? It is Satan. And what is Satan's primary you know, sin is being lifted up with pride. Being full of himself. Wanting to be like the Most High. Wanting to, to have these positions and not being content with what he's already been given when he was given so much. And... Time and time and time again in scripture, we see the examples when people get lifted up with pride. Nebuchadnezzar, perfect example, got lifted up with pride. What happened? Hey, God blessed him by being this ruler in charge of like the whole known world or whatever at the time that that he was able to get in this position of power. And what's he doing? Oh, look at this great kingdom that I built, that I did. And you know what? I'm going to say this. Be careful when you're doing spiritual works, especially like, hey, that's just, that's a city. That's a nation, man. God raises up and God puts down. And when it comes to churches and when it comes to preaching the gospel and when it comes to doing great things for God, you better make sure that you're giving the glory unto God. Amen. That you're not going, hey, look at this great work that I built. Hey, look at Stronghold Baptist Church that I built. Hey, look at Strong- the Stronghold in Greenville that I built. Hey, look at all this stuff that I'm doing. Right. No, look at what the Lord is doing. Amen. When you start getting too lifted up with pride, that's going to be a problem. You start getting blinded with pride. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, verse number 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 16, verse 5 says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. You have a a proud heart. The Bible says you're an abomination. Strong words, right? Doesn't the Bible also say that like sodomites are an abomination? Right, that when a man lies with man, he lies with a woman. It's an abomination. Well, you know what? I don't want to be having words used against me that would be like used against a sodomite. But you know what? If you're proud in heart, that word is being used against you just like it is for a man lying with a man. It's an abomination in God's eyes. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination. And you know what? To the Lord, it doesn't matter how many people are joined together with the proud. Because God is, the Bible says that they're not going to be unpunished. It doesn't matter how many people are yoked up together. The proud heart doesn't go unpunished. Verse uh, 18, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly, than to divide the spoil with the proud. Especially that second verse there, verse 19. Hey, you know, it's a lot better just to stay humble. And if that means you're with the lowly, then fine. It's way better, though, to stay humble. It's way better not to have all the increase and all the blessing and all this other stuff. I'd rather just stay humble with the lowly than to divide the spoil, right? All the riches, all this excess, all this extra with the proud. If it means I'm going to have all this extra, but then I have to be with the proud. No, I'll just I'll just hang out with the lowly. I'm good with the lowly. You proud can have all of that gain. Why is that? Because pride goeth before destruction. Because if you're hanging out then and you want to be yoked up with the proud to divide the spoil, well, guess what? Destruction's on its way. And I don't want to be there when it happens. Proverbs 29, verse 22. An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. All throughout scripture, you turn back to Jeremiah 13. These are just a few examples of what happens when people get full of themselves, when they get lifted up in pride and they start thinking how great they are. 
and thinking so highly of themselves, hey, God's going to bring you low. God will abase you. It's just, it's going to happen for certain. As As true as the Bible is, we need to be aware of that. We need to not let ourselves fall into the trap of pride. Because it's easy to do when things are starting to go really well. And especially success after success after success after success. It feels good. And it is good. And hey, praise the Lord for it. But don't forget to praise the Lord for it. Amen. When things are going good, praise the Lord for it. And don't put yourself in that and make sure it's always about Christ. It's always about the Lord. And with every great thing that happens, how about you honor God first with all of it? And don't put yourself up there and don't allow yourself to get lifted up because pride goeth before destruction. This is exactly what's going on here with the children of Israel. They're just lifted up in themselves. They think everything's great. They think God's with them. They think they can do no wrong. And they can do whatever they want and they can make up the the imaginations of their own heart and everything's going to be just fine. And in their minds, hey, it's all great. I don't want to hear this Jeremiah guy. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. I don't want to hear that stuff. That's how they treated him. I mean, they threw him in a dungeon. They didn't want to hear him so bad. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's just, you know, his words aren't being received. They don't want to hear it. They're having a good time. But the words are still true. Their pride brings them down. They go low. They get taken captive. They get destroyed. They're brought out of their land. You know, they become like that girdle that's just good for nothing. Verse 16, Jeremiah 13, verse 16. Give glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness. It's exactly what I was just saying. You know, when you're, when you're proud, you're full of yourself. Give the glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness. And, you know, people get blinded by pride. Yeah. And the children of Israel here, the children of Ju- Judah and Jerusalem, they, they're totally blinded. They can't see what's going on. Darkness can be caused, and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains, and while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. So, you know, he said basically he's saying, hurry up and honor God. Hurry up and repent and get right with God before this darkness comes, and then it becomes this gross darkness. I was just preaching on this, I don't know how long ago it was. You know, talking about these really wicked people in the world that just kind of get to this point where they think they're God. Right? They get so proud that they just equate themselves with God. And it's just like, how do you how do you not see that? Like how do you how can you actually think that about you? Everyone else is going like, man, you're nuts. But they're out there. It's a real thing. People get lifted up like that. And you know, whether it be Pharaoh or whether it be Nebuchadnezzar, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled, but then he finally came around. And hey, thank God for that, right? That he recognized and honored the, the, the Lord God of heaven that, uh, that was able to humble him. And you know what? Thank God for humbling the proud. Amen. That for many, there, that, that doesn't have to be the end. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to deal with that humbling process. <laughs> I'd rather just get there on my own than have to be brought down and forced to be abased and forced to be brought low before I have to, you know, give the honor back and the glory to the Lord. So, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the honor and the glory just right now. <laughs> please, please, just um, don't, um, don't, don't force me low. I'll be lowly. I'll stay with the lowly. Verse 17, but if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. Now look at the heart of Jeremiah. Look at the heart of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is preaching the word of the Lord. Clearly, right? And he's going to say whatever it is that God wants him to say. And he's going to do it faithfully. Fully trusting in the the word of God. And he does it. But then he says, you know what? If if you're not going to hear it. Because he still doesn't want to see the people destroyed. 
He wants them to get help. He wants them to turn right. He wants them to, to, to humble themselves. So if you're not going to hear it, my soul is going to weep in secret places for your pride. This is going to bring me down. My eyes going to weep sore and run down with tears. Why? Because I know what's going to happen. Because if your pride isn't right, then the Lord's flock is carried away captive. If you don't get that right, I can see all the damage that's going to happen. All the fallout from your pride. And there's weeping. It's sad. It's not rejoicing. It's not going, ha, ha, ha. That's what you get. You get what you deserve, you proud Judah and Jerusalem. No. He doesn't want to see that happen. But he's preaching the truth. They, they don't want to hear it, but hey. It's the word of God. It's, it's up to them to decide. Verse 18, say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves, sit down, for your principalities shall come down, even the crown of your glory. Now, I'd imagine for a king and a queen, that's not an easy thing to do once you're already established as the king and the queen, to humble yourself. But hey, the word of the Lord isn't a respect of persons. It comes to all. The king, the queen, everybody in Judah, everybody in Jerusalem, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. The cities of the south shall be shut up and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee? Thy beautiful flock. You were given a flock. You were given, you were given people. What, you know, where are they? What happened? What wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? For thou hast taught them to be captains and as chief over thee. Shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? And if thou say in thine heart, wherefore come these things upon me? For the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered and thy heels made bare. Now, I was going to, I'll probably just do this in a separate sermon. But um, that word skirts there, and, and maybe I will, maybe I won't, I probably will. Uh, I, where I just go through all these examples. Because people, I don't know, people get screwed up on this. But when it says, when the Bible's talking about skirts, it's not talking about what we commonly refer to as skirts as clothing that women wear. At all. The skirts are just the lower portion of, of whatever garment or whatever it is that you're talking about. So like, here's the skirts of my coat. Here's the skirts of it. Here's the skirts of my pants. The skirts are the, are the lower portions of it. And when the skirts are discovered, what do you say? The heels are made bare. So, um, anyways, that's, I'm kind of going to go into that probably another time. I didn't want to go through the whole, um, because I'd rather just do that in a separate sermon altogether. But, you know, some people say like, oh, men wear skirts in the Bible and, and all this other stuff. And it's just kind of like, no, that's not what it's talking about. Um, Verse 23, famous verse, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. And what a powerful verse, right? I mean, obviously, look, no one can change their skin. The leopard can't change his spots. Like you, That's so just part of you, right? And as much as that just, I mean, you can't change that. He says, then may ye also do good that are accustomed. Once you get accustomed to do this evil, he's saying, like, you're not going to do good. You're not going to change. Makes me think, man, I don't really want to ever get accustomed to doing evil. Because I don't ever want to get to the point where it's going, yeah, it's, it, it, now you're so accustomed to doing evil that you can't even really do good anymore. Because you've just been used to doing evil for so long. That's tough. And, and, you know, habits are pretty hard to break, you know, especially really bad habits and things doing really wrong things or whatever for a long period of time. It becomes really hard to, to undo that or to do good and, and change what, what that is. It's not easy. It can be done, but it's not easy. Here he's just saying, I mean, they're just, these people 
in in Judah and Jerusalem, they're just pretty much given over, right? I mean, we already saw that earlier in the earlier chapters and continuing through the same thought. They're done for. They're doomed. Therefore will I scatter them as the stubble that passeth away by the wind of the wilderness. This is thy lot, the portion of thy measures from me, saith the Lord. Because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. So, this is what's going to happen. As you say, the portion of thy measures from me. This is what's going to happen. This is, this is how I'm going to punish you. This is what you're going to receive because you've forgotten me. You've forgotten what I'm all about. You forgot who I am. You forgot me. They set up idolatries. You know, they, they, they went after these false gods. They, they were discovering the, the, the cares of their own hearts and, and more worried about whatever their heart could desire and, and come up with. And that's their trusting in a falsehood and something that's just fake not real, these false gods, and they've forgotten the Lord. Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear. Again, this is talking about just lifting up the clothing and making them naked to just expose the the parts that ought to be covered, their nakedness. I have seen thine adulteries and thy neighings, the lewdness of thy whoredom and thine abominations, on the hills in the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? So, first of all, I would say in the context, when it's talking about their adulteries, their neighings, the lewdness, their whoredom, and the abominations on the hills in the fields, I think that's talking about them still, the idolatry and going after the, the fake gods and everything else. It just seems really consistent with the scripture. But obviously, uh, just the other sense of adulteries and neighings after the neighbor's wives and, and whoredoms and stuff, would, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that was going on too. And you know, I think we could see the references to that in other chapters, but um, it's just a bunch of wickedness going on. That's why it's, woe unto thee, O Jerusalem. And just, wilt thou not be made clean? Don't you want to be made clean? Like, aren't, like, can't you just get right? And in that last phrase, when shall it once be? Like, when's it going to be over? When, when shall it be that it, that it once happened? Right? It's a really beautiful way of putting it. When shall it once be? When's it going to be over? When are you going to come around? Lots of warning from the book of Jeremiah. Warning, warning for our country, warning for us as believers, warnings about God's judgment on things like pride, warning on God's judgment on things where you just forget about God, right? And you start getting rid of God, and as a whole country and as a whole nation, we're, you know, kind of digging into that dark rock. And just becoming marred to the point to where you're going to be good for nothing. And, you know, take whatever you can out of this. Let's apply, you know, these stories, even though we read about Judah and Jerusalem and their pride and how they were destroyed. You know, God gives a lot of of warning about this, not just for nations, but for individuals, of course, and how he feels about that. And we need to make sure that we keep ourselves humble. We keep ourselves lowly. And don't allow ourselves to get blinded with pride and lift it up um, and think of ourselves higher than we ought to. Or anyone else, for that matter, of, of, of unduly exalting those that um, you know, may have great accomplishments or whatever, but, but still um, not idolizing anybody and lifting people up more than is appropriate. Uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this chapter. We thank you for all the things that we can learn out of the book of Jeremiah. I pray that you please help us to take heed to these warnings. I pray that you please soften our hearts and help us to be humble and be able to receive your word and help us not to go wayward, dear Lord, but um, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't harden our hearts or stiffen our necks and that we would always be 
uh, receptive and open to, to receiving correction and receiving instruction as Jeremiah was trying to do to the people, dear Lord, help us to, to be open to hearing the warnings. And um, God, we love you. We thank you for this church. We thank you for bringing these people together, all of us, dear Lord, to serve you. I pray that your name would be glorified through this ministry and help us to be good examples of what it means to walk in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.